Political Poison, Book 2, Paul Turner Mystery, Author, Mark Richard Zubro, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1993, Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 8 Paul trudged up the steps into his house. No light shone here or in Mrs. Tolucci's next door. He'd worked nearly 16 hours every day since Tuesday. His shoulders sagged, his head drooped. He used his key to unlock the front door. He felt for the light switch to the right and flicked it on. The brass lamp on the end table nearest the door shone dimly. Turner halted. Giovanni Pirelli sat in the brown overstuffed chair. Recliner pulled out, feet resting on it. Pirelli gave him a smile. Turner saw even white dentures. He gazed at the dark brown eyes, the only real color in the gray ashen face. Who let you in? Paul asked. He glanced toward Jeff's room, then toward the stairs and Bryant's. You boys are fine, Pirelli said. Paul glanced around the room. A noise from the kitchen drew his attention. The burly guard shuffled into the room. Paul heard him dragging something behind him, then realized it was someone. The guard dumped Frank Riken onto the couch. Dad, Brian appeared from in back of the guard. He had a red mark under his chin. I tried to keep them out, Brian said. The guard didn't try to stop Brian from joining his dad near the door. Paul examined his son's face. Is Jeff all right? Yeah, he's still asleep. They didn't bother him. Paul turned to Pirelli. Uh, what is this? He demanded. How dare you break into my house? Pirelli said, I'm old. I'm sorry. I forget. I have news and I'm angry. Your son was overly vigorous and trying to keep us out. I'm sorry we hurt him. He's a good boy. Takes after his father. Wanted to protect his younger brother, most of all. I wouldn't have come if it wasn't important. Again, I apologize. Please sit down. Paul tossed his coat on the back of the couch and sat on the armrest closest to Pirelli. Brian stood behind him. The guard moved into the shadows of the hallway. he just emerged from. Paul noted the rise and fall of Riken's chest in the soft light from the one lamp. He could see a multitude of bruises on the right side of his face. Dark crimson patches stretched from shoulder to waist on the front of his shirt. Is he okay? Paul asked. I'm told he will regain consciousness and will have a tremendous headache. Of the bruises you see, his wound was tended. He will be all right. What happened to him? Turner asked. He was going to blow the whistle on our entire scheme, Pirelli said. I didn't know that. For Mrs. Tolucci's sake, I will swear to you that I did not know that when you came to see me last night, I have no idea if you could possibly believe me. Maybe that isn't important. The withered hands lifted several inches off his lap, palm outward. At any rate, I was not told. People whose names I need not mention heard about it. They thought Mr. Riken had to be stopped. Uh, they found this out Tuesday morning. He had gone to Mr. Giles late Monday night. Giles couldn't get hold of anyone that night. He called early Tuesday. We tried to find Mr. Riken. He proved quite elusive. And then Giles was murdered. The news delayed the search for Riken. Originally, some people thought he'd done it. After the delay, the search resumed. He put up more of a fight than anyone thought. He had to be frightened into silence. He didn't seem ready to listen to reason. People who were sent got rough. There is no need for violence in these matters. People simply need to be convinced. Why attack that media consultant Stimson? Paul asked. Riken had told him. They planned to work together to expose Giles. Our people talked to Mr. Stimson. He balked at first, but then saw the light of reason. The old head shook Pirelli, ran a hand through his wisp of white hair. I am too old for this sort of thing. I no longer have a stomach for such nonsense. I heard Mr. Stimson has plans to leave town, has a campaign in California to run. He was scared off, Paul said. Yes, Pirelli said. What's to keep either of them from talking, Paul asked. If the fools who attacked them had thought a minute, I would have known that with Giles dead, Riken had no proof. He had no documentation. The one man who could prove his allegations was dead. There was no need for anyone to get beaten up. Riken should have been talked to and shown the error of his ways, but younger, more volatile people are in charge now. 
they don't understand how to use reason. Stimson has no commitment to Chicago. He's an outsider who comes in to do jobs. He doesn't care about politics in the city. Why bring Reich in here? Paul asked. As a peace offering. A way to show that what I'm telling you is the truth. And we have no use for the man. He can face whatever his problems are with neither threat nor help from us. Uh, Dad, Jeff's voice called from down the hall. Paul pushed past the guard and hurried into Jeff's room. He'd have killed Pirelli's guard if he'd tried to keep him from his son. Jeff was trying to swing his legs off his bed and get into his wheelchair. Paul picked him up and carried him into the living room. Jeff sat blinking at the light. What's going on, Dad? Jeff asked. I would never hurt your children, Pirelli said. The old man gazed at the boy's withered legs. This man is a friend of Mrs. Tolucci's, Paul said. Oh, Jeff said. He settled into his father's lap. Uh, why is he here so late? He doesn't have as many manners as Mrs. Tolucci, Paul said. Jeff pointed to Riken on the couch. What's wrong with him? The boy said. He's an unlikely suspect in one of my investigations, Paul said. Is he a killer? Jeff asked. No, son, Paul said. He's a man who needs help. Jeff yawned and snuggled his head into Paul's shoulder. In a minute, he fell asleep. Pirelli's soft voice said, I am very sorry. I am an old and foolish. I should not have come here. Somebody shot at me and my partner at the University of Chicago this afternoon, Paul said. Pirelli glanced at his guard. I can place a few guards around you, Pirelli offered. Paul laughed. I don't think the bad guy should be protecting the cops. Tell me why I'm being attacked. Same reason Rankin was attacked. The people who planned this are running scared. I didn't get to them until late this afternoon. Obviously, after they attacked you, I... I told them I had told you everything and that I will talk to the press if you are not left alone. I see you now with your sons, and I wish I had memories of my father like that, but more. I promised Rose to keep you safe. A uh, promise to Rose to Lucci is more important to me than politics, especially at my age. You will not be harmed. You will not be bothered again. It has been taken care of. I don't want to owe you a favor, Paul said. The old man looked pained. Accept it. Then I am paying back more of my debt to Rose. Paul nodded. Pirelli said, You have your answer. The political situation did not require or need death as a solution. As far as we are concerned, Gideon Giles could still be alive. His death was a blow to our control of the city. He was not going to blow the whistle. Your murderer lies elsewhere. How can I be sure your people were telling you the truth? Paul asked. They lied to you before. Pirelli inclined his head toward his guard. I had Barney convince them it was in their best interest to tell me the truth. Uh, they didn't kill Kenny Giles. He rose to his feet. His bodyguard hurried to his side. But Pirelli did not take the preferred assistance. Pirelli said, I again deeply apologize for inconveniencing you. He walked over to Paul and patted him on the shoulder. At the door, Pirelli said, I leave you, Mr. Riken. I, I hope he has a more successful life in the future than he's had up to now. If he talks to the police or the press... I will make no move to stop him. People will have to pay for this blundering. Paul carried Jeff back to bed. The boy murmured briefly when he left his father's arms, but didn't fully waken. Paul called an ambulance. They arrived in 15 minutes and took Riken away. Before the paramedics left, they confirmed to Paul that Riken was in stable condition, but they would know more when he regained consciousness. Paul called the 12th District and told them to have a guard placed on Riken at Cook County Hospital until he had a chance to talk to him in the morning. After they left, Paul and Brian sat at the kitchen table. I'm sorry they got in, Brian said. I should have been able to protect the house better. You did fine, son. The guy's a professional. I want to wrap this case up and get back to you guys as much as possible. I haven't seen enough of you. I'm sorry. It's okay, Dad. I understand, really. Upstairs, ready to enter their separate bedrooms, Brian asked, Did you really get shot at again? Yeah, Paul said. Let's talk about it in the morning. Minutes later, Paul crawled into bed. A loud baying intruded on his sleep. He opened an eye and saw daylight streaming through the bedroom window. His door opened and Brian stuck his head around the door. 
What? Paul asked. His older son strode across the room. He held the Sunday edition of the Chicago Tribune. Brian pointed at the front page. Paul read the headline. Cops attacked at UFC. Last night, you only said you'd been shot at. You didn't say anything about an attack like this. Ben's downstairs. Mrs. Tolucci's more furious than I've ever seen her. Ian's left two messages on the machine. You didn't hear the phone? Brian sat on the edge of the bed. Why did you tell me last night? Paul rubbed his morning beard. I didn't see the point. Last night, in describing each shot, the paper talks about machine gun fire, Brian said. Paul sat up and took the paper from his son. Didn't they see this on the news last night? I only watched the sports scores. I guess none of them saw it. Brian's eyes searched his father's anxiously. Is everything really going to be all right? There was no machine gun fire, Paul said. The reporter exaggerated a little here and there and conveniently left out a few things. Makes for a more exciting story. He put the paper down. I would never let anything hurt you boys, Paul touched Brian's arm. Nothing is more important to me in the world than you and Jeff. I couldn't be prouder of how you handled yourself last night or the way you're concerned about me now. Thanks. He noted the beginning of a smile on his son's face. Brian said, You better talk to the people in the kitchen pretty quick. If you could leave me in peace for a couple minutes, I'll get myself downstairs and greet the concerned masses. Fifteen minutes later, showered and shaved, Paul walked into his kitchen. Ian was now present along with Brian, Jeff, Ben, and Mrs. Tolucci. Questions flew for about two minutes, then Paul called for order. Mrs. Tolucci spoke firmly. I have already spoken to Giovanni Pirelli. He said he apologized last night. He will make restitution. I don't want anything from him, Paul said. Paul asked if anyone wanted breakfast. Mrs. Tolucci said she'd fix it. Paul tried to insist he'd make it. While he waited for breakfast, he called Fenwick. They agreed to meet at Area 10 at 1. He outlined his meeting with Pirelli. Okay, Fenwick said. Giovanni thinks it wasn't the politicians. How do we know he isn't simply trying to take the heat off them? Well, we don't, Turner said. He told Fenwick he'd fill him in on the details when they met. Ian made a number of calls to the people in the reform organizations. They agreed to pass the word that the meeting would take place at 2.30 instead of noon. Over breakfast, they all wanted to know every detail about the shooting. Were you scared, Dad? Jeff asked at one point. They all looked at Paul. Very much so, he told his son. I'm glad you're okay, his younger son said. Me too, Ben said. He managed to calm all their fears. He wondered when he'd have time to deal with his own. Ben caught him alone for a minute as Paul took his gun out of the safe in his bedroom. Are you okay? Ben asked. Mostly. They hugged briefly. We can talk about it later, he said. He promised to call Ben that night. The trip to Cook County Hospital, just a few blocks away, took only a few moments. When Turner walked in, he found Riken staring out the window of his room. He turned his head toward the door. Purple bruises shone out of his pale face. He looked only slightly better than last night. What happened? Riken asked. Turner pulled up a hospital chair and told him about the events of the night before. Then he asked Riken about the campaign manager's misadventures. Riken told a tale of abduction straight out of Beirut terrorism. I was scared then, but I'm not going to let them get away with this. Turner admired his courage, if not his intelligence. I'm going to fight this, Riken said. I lied to them yesterday. This isn't a totalitarian state. I'm going to expose them. Turner had brought Ayn with him. He called his friend in from the corridor. He left the two of them alone. Turner had made no promises to Morelli, felt no need to protect the man. After his invasion of the house, and Pirelli had said he wouldn't intercede if Riken went public. Turner doubted if any investigation would ever reach Pirelli. The old man wasn't in charge anymore. The younger man had made some stupid decisions. Turner was ten minutes late, getting to Area 10 to meet Fenwick. They endured questions from half the people in the building about how the investigation was going. They responded respectfully and carefully to the questions from the watch captain and the area commander. And these two made it clear that the pressure was still on and they needed a suspect. Turner and Fenwick talked to Wilson. She said, I've interrogated all the people connected to the Gideon Giles campaign organization and ward office who got fired in the past year. I had Blessing upstairs run checks on all of them. 
Nobody struck me as a murder suspect. Since we don't know when they put the poison in, I couldn't very well pin them down to alibis for every minute after Monday morning. I still asked, but nobody stood out as a blatant liar. I think these people are a dead end. They thanked her and trooped upstairs to ask Blessing if he had anything for them. Blessing tie loosened and looking like he hadn't slept said, I've got the campaign financial disclosure data here. I've cross-referenced it with all of our other data. I got one or two odd things. He led them over to his charts and began to explain. Five minutes after he started, Fenwick said, I'm lost already. To steal it. We've got a meeting in a few minutes. Two of the liberal organizations show up everywhere. The anti-fur people and the save the porpoises. Anti-fur? Fenwick asked. You know, Turner said. They accost people on the street who wear animal skins. No porpoises in the Fifth Ward, Fenwick said. Blessing ignored him. What's odd is, we can't connect them to any legitimate group. We've got documentation on everybody else, but not on them. Other groups either gave money or got help. Just like these, but they're all registered, nice and proper, like they're supposed to be. Or at least have addresses that check out as legitimate. Took us nearly a day to track some of them down. These, these two don't check out. Uh, they're fake, Fenwick said. I think it lots at the address. Money went back and forth. A few thousand each year. Could be dummy groups for shifting campaign money around illegally. I thought the anti-fur crowd was real, Turner said. They are, Blessing said. It's just this branch of their group doesn't check out. I wouldn't call them fake. They're on paper, but they don't check out. It's something odd. Thought you might want to see it. They thanked him for his detailed work before driving to their meeting. Turner returned Clark Burke's call from the night before. He asked Burke to meet him at the Sheridan Park Community Center at 5. This was in the park a half block from the Turner home. Turner didn't tell Burke that was where Jeff had a game. The university student agreed to take the bus over and join him. Ian had set up the meeting with the leaders of most of Giles' social welfare groups at the Buckingham Avenue Workers' Church. Large numbers of the organizations used the space there for meetings and other activities. Many of the city's famous liberals had come from the congregation. Ian wasn't there. Turner assumed he was still with Riken. He hoped his friend would show up before the end. Turner tried to find out which groups were which. He wanted to talk to the fur and porpoises, see if they'd even bothered to show. And they met in the church auditorium. Two foot strips of alternating primary colors filled one wall. The stage was bare. Opposite the painting wall was a graffiti mural. It stretched from the front of the room to the back. Names, slogans, childlike drawings, plus community art from ceiling to floor. Eventually, Turner addressed the group. He explained the police needed their help in gathering information about who might want to murder Giles, and by doing so, harm their causes. The two detectives listened to attacks on the police for not doing enough to solve the murder and not reaching out to various communities. Three people berated them for police brutality. Many of the people in the audience agreed that the murder was probably a conspiracy by right-wing religious fundamentalists trying to hurt their causes. Around four, Ian showed up. He joined Turner in front of the room. Ian whispered in his ear while a man with a white beard spoke about requiring classical music in all preschools and daycare centers. Ian said, just got done with a press conference with Riken. All the media were there. We're talking big time. I got a promise of some protection for the two of us for a while. Good thing, Turner said. Pirelli and his cronies might not want to hurt you, but I think there are other people who are still dangerous. I glanced down at the crowd. Why hasn't Fenwick arrested all of them yet? I was kind of hoping he would. Turner looked at Fenwick for all his partner's volatility. He knew he'd be calm. They stressed in cops' training about diffusing tense situations. Instead of turning them into conflagrations, he'd seen Fenwick in the middle of tough spots when crowds had begun to gather after an arrest. Fenwick had earned commendations for his behavior at those points. Turner whispered back to Ian. He puts it on cruise control. He gets angry with witnesses and suspects, but he's never ruined an arrest because of it. Turner told Ian he wanted to talk to anybody connected with the anti-fur and save the porpoises groups. Ian scanned the crowd. Call a recess, he said. I know who most of these people are, but I can find somebody who knows everybody. 
Five minutes later, the man with the beard sat down. Turner quickly rose and called for a pause. As the room broke up into scattered groups, Ian led the two cops to a woman in white jeans and a gray shirt with a clerical collar. Ian introduced her as the pastor of the church and explained what the detectives wanted to know. She said, I work closely with most of these people and the Giles campaign. I know everyone in the room. I've never seen or heard of any organization called Anti-Fur or Save the Porpoises. She introduced the detectives to the leaders of the Anti-Cruelty and the Save the Whales groups, but none of them had heard of the groups. Turner and Fenwick wanted. The meeting ended a few minutes later. Outside the church, Turner thanked Ian for setting up the conference on such short notice. What's going to happen with Riken? Turner asked. I'm going to win another Pulitzer Prize, Ian said. We are going to need a lot more proof. He sighed. Riken has this odd view that if he put it on television, all the true and right people will win. He's read too many of his own press releases. We'll get lots of pressure on the politicians because of the press conference, but what we really need is a few more people who did the actual infiltrating to come forward. I've got a hot lead on that. I am left. This meeting was a disaster, Fenwick said as they drove to Area 10. I didn't know I was a boar hunting beast of the primeval forest. I've been meaning to talk to you about that, Turner said. Very funny. Who called you that? Who remembers? And who cares? They drove in silence the rest of the way to Area 10. Fenwick turned off the engine. Neither of them moved to get out of the car. Now what? Fenwick asked. Turner said, I go home. Big up Jeff. And we go to his baseball game. I have no ideas on the case. We can send Blessing and his computers hunting for these fake liberal groups. He's probably already tried everything possible to check them out. We've talked to most of the suspects and witnesses at least twice. We've tried every lead and every possibility. Uh, the commander, the press, and the politicians can scream their heads off, but we ain't got nothing, and I, for one, am going to have some time for my family. Minutes later, Turner walked into his house. Brian was on the phone from what the 17-year-old said. It sounded like he was trying to convince a date to join him at the basketball game. Jeff was in his room. He changed into his warm-up suit with rolling rockets emblazoned in bright red on the front. Are you coming to the game, Dad? Jeff asked. Sure am. Ben said he was going to try and make it. I hope I get to play more this time. Brian at the door to the room said, Just try your best, Squirt. Are you bringing Marcia? Jeff asked his older brother. Said she'd be there. I like her, Jeff said. Have I met Marcia? Paul asked. Do I want to meet Marcia? She's just another one of Brian's girlfriends, Jeff said. I bet she brought me popcorn and a Coke at the last game. She was nice. They arrived 15 minutes before the game was to start. Ben met them in the parking lot of the field house. Paul walked in with Jeff on his shoulders. His younger son waved and called to his friends, rushing about the court, shooting baskets, warming up for the game. Clark Burke sat on the bottom row of the bleachers. He saw Paul and stood up, giving him a mystified look. Paul introduced him to Jeff, Ben, and Brian. Burke looked at all three of them quizzically. I you have two sons, Burke asked. Yeah, Brian said. It makes him feel macho. A pretty blonde-haired girl waved to Brian from across the court. Brian practically lopped over to her. Paul talked to the coach and the parents, most of whom he knew. He met Marcia. She smiled shyly at him and greeted him politely. Paul liked her already. Even Myra, ace mechanic, showed up to cheer Jeff on. The game began. Paul sat between Ben and Burke. The college student looked confused. During a break in the action, he asked softly, Why am I here? I wanted you to meet my sons and my lover. Paul said, Oh, Burke said. He was very quiet for most of the rest of the game, although he did tell Turner early on that the campus police had two suspects in the trashing of Burke's room. And they were a couple of neo-Nazis who'd seen his name connected with the Gideon Giles investigation. They would planned on attacking some gay person on campus, but figured he'd be more vulnerable and shook up if they attacked now. How they catch them? Turner asked. Burke told him that the guys had tried to trash another dorm room, but many of the floors had banded together to provide a crime watch on each floor. 
They practically walked into a trap, Burke said. Turner told Burke he was glad they caught the guys and hoped that would be the end of the problem. Uh, what about your computer? Turner asked. Everything they wrecked, they're going to have to pay for. Jeff got to play for five minutes and scored his first basket in the game. His team won by eight points. After the game, Jeff twirled his wheelchair around and around in the basketball court. Did you see that, Dad? He called when he calmed down enough to talk to people. Paul hugged his son and congratulated him. Jeff and Brian exchanged a complicated series of handshakes. Myra hugged Jeff and kissed him on the forehead, but said she had other plans, so couldn't stop for the victory party. Paul insisted Burke accompany them to the house for a post-game celebration. Burke wound up walking ahead with Brian and Jeff. Paul unzipped his jacket and took a deep gulp of the fresh spring breeze. This is beautiful, he said. Ben murmured to Paul. Are you sure you want to bring him along? Yes, he's got a puppy crush on me. I figure it'll save him some embarrassment. He hasn't asked me for a date or declared his love. This way he sees how I live. You, the boys, I think he's a decent kid. He hasn't had a lot of chances to socialize with an older group of gay people. He's had his peers, which can sometimes be more unsettling to the ego than anything else. They sat in the kitchen, laughed, and talked, ate hot dogs and beans. Clark seemed to become more at ease after Jeff asked if he was a murder suspect, and Paul told him no, that he was someone he'd met at the beginning of the investigation at the university. Ben left a few minutes after seven. Paul left Brian and Jeff to clean the kitchen. He sat with Burke in the living room. This is really nice, Burke said. Paul thanked him. Silence fell between them. Paul let it build. Burke sat on the couch, clasping and unclasping his hands. He said, uh, thank you for not letting me make a fool out of myself. You're welcome, Paul said. Uh, Brian and Jeff know you're gay, Burke asked. You'll be able to tell your family someday, Paul said. I uh, hope so. Paul asked how his new room was. Burke seemed pleased with it. Burke brought up the murder and asked how the investigation was going. Paul outlined some of what they'd done. It's still scary when I think about it. Later, Brian offered to drive Burke home. Clark turned him down, but accepted a ride when Paul made a similar suggestion. A few minutes later, Paul drove the college student to the dorm, and they talked little. As Burke got out of the car, he said, Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad I met all those people. Turner decided to stop in Area 10 before returning home. It was only a few blocks out of the way. He wanted to see if there'd been any developments connected with Riken at the admitting desk. They told him nothing had been reported on the murder, but that the campaign finance irregularities had already been assigned to a special unit at 11th and State. The squad room was deserted. On the fourth floor, he found Blessing tapping the keys of a computer. The cop gave him a nod of hello and said nothing new had come in. Turner wandered over to the wall displays. He'd gone over Blessing's chart of people. Now he gazed at the hundreds of campaign brochures displayed on one of the other walls. He studied them idly. Blessing eased up next to him. It's something, isn't it? He said. Turner nodded. I put them up in order by years. The ones you're looking at are from the first campaign. Turner saw a younger getting Giles and his wife shaking hands, posing in front of significant landmarks. In the neighborhood, the two cops wandered down the wall examining them. Funny, Turner said when he'd gone through several years. After the first year or so, Mrs. Giles stops turning up. Blessing joined him for an hour. They minutely inspected all of the propaganda documents. She's not in any of them for the past six years, Turner said. Why is that odd? Blessing asked. And Mrs. Giles told us she was very involved in her husband's campaigns. You got all that stuff up here we took from Giles' office at the university? Blessing directed him to a stack of cartons, each labeled by its contents. It took several minutes for Turner to find the box with the materials from the top of Giles' desk. No photo of him and his wife, Turner said. And I'm sure there wasn't one. Everybody has a picture of themselves and their wives and kids on their desk, Blessing said. People like to personalize the space they occupy, Turner said. I've got pictures of my kids on my desk. Fenwick is one of his family. Do you? Blessing nodded. It's a normal thing, but this guy had nothing. I think I want to talk to Laura Giles again. He called Fenwick and told him what he had found. Fenwick showed up a half hour later. Together, they drove to the Giles' home. Alex Hill opened the door. He glowered at them, but led them to the living room. Lilac Ostergaard sat on the black leather couch next to Laura Giles, holding her hand. Laura Giles looked at the two detectives and shuddered. 
Want me to throw them out? Alex asked. Alex, if you could wait in the den, she said. I'll talk to you later, she said this quietly and without anger. Alex hesitated, but Lilac gave him a sharp look and he left. Lilac said, Do you want me to go, Laura? No, stay please, she said. She looks at the two cops. Why aren't you in any of your husband's campaign literature? For the past six years, Turner asked. You don't have to talk to these men, Lilac said. Laura Giles whispered. I felt so shut out. You lied to us when you said you worked closely with him in his campaigns, Turner asked. Turner could barely hear her murmur. Yes. You went to his office on Monday, didn't you? Turner asked. Laura Giles' body quivered. She grabbed a tissue from the box on the coffee table. Tears streamed down her cheeks. I knew his secretary was gone on vacation. If I saw anyone, I could just say I was there to see Gideon, but nobody was around. I found his supply of health food drinks. I poured in the poison and ran. I was petrified that someone would see me on the way out. No one did. A few minutes later, I met him in the quadrangle for lunch. Laura Giles told how she had endured her husband's increasing coldness and cruelty for years. It had been building for years. I was loyal and helpful. During all that time, I had that fatuous politician's wife look down perfectly. He used me all up. I had done everything right, and he dumped me. It would have been better if there was another woman. It made me even angrier because I was competing against his ambition. I could fight another woman, but I didn't know how to fight his career. He just didn't care for me, and like a stupid fool, I still loved him. I was addicted to him, and the more he deprived me of his love, the more I needed it. She continued in a whisper. All the years we worked together, and he told me last week he wanted a divorce. He hadn't told anyone yet because he wanted to think about how it would affect his political chances. Not because he loved me, but because of how it would hurt his goddamn career. Later, at Area 10, Turner avoided the brass that showed up and dodged the press. Uh, they did enough paperwork to satisfy the needs of the arrest and left the rest of it until the morning. Turner found both of his boys in the front room, watching television. A little late for a school night, Jeff, Paul said. We saw on television where you solved the murder, Jeff said. Ian was on it too, Brian said, with the guy who was here last night. They said they had the biggest scandal to hit the city in years. Was that part of the murder? Paul gave brief explanations. He tucked Jeff into bed, gave his son an extra hug in the living room. He found Brian reading a book. His son looked up. Did Jeff finally calm down? He asked. He scored his first basket. He'll be in heaven for days. Or until his next game, Brian said. Paul got up. Don't stay up too late, he said. Brian nodded. As Paul reached the bottom step to go up to his room and catch up on his sleep, Brian called, uh, Dad? Paul looked back at his son. I'm glad you're okay, Brian said. Paul smiled. Me too. See you in the morning. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.